Good evening. Today, McGarvey Black has come back to talk to me about her new book, The Fussy Virgin, which is out tomorrow. So good evening, McGarvey. Would you like to introduce yourself again and tell us a little bit more about The Fussy Virgin? Oh, sure, Donna. Sure. Um, I am an American author and I am currently with Bloodhound Books and my fourth book is coming out tomorrow, February 8th. And it is a departure for me. My first three books were uh, thrillers. And this one is a romantic comedy, which truthfully is where my heart is. That's, you know, given a choice of watching a thriller movie or a rom-com, I choose a rom-com every time. So uh, while I do enjoy murder and mayhem, serial killers, <laughs> and, uh, I prefer, you know, happy, happily ever after endings. So um I can, you know, so tomorrow the book is coming out and I'm very excited about it. Um, what made you choose to go for it and write a rom-com? Um, I think I, I, when I first started writing, I was writing screenplays and I wrote about three screenplays, which were all rom-coms. And um, it, it was where I felt the most comfortable. You know, I, I naturally tend to like to make jokes and so you can't really do that in a when somebody's being murdered. It's 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 a little. <laughs> I, I I do though. I will say I try to stick a little humor even in those books, but um, you know I I I enjoy doing the funny stuff. And so doing a rom com gave me that platform where I could make it funny and throw jokes in and crazy situations. So I think that's why I I gravitated towards that. And um, what ha I'll tell you the background on the Fussy Virgin and how it actually came to be. So Donna, you read it, so you know what happens, but it's about a woman who's a telemarketer named Callie, who um, is desperate to get to a Valentine's Day party to meet some guy. And she's got a, she has to fulfill a number of opinion poll telephone surveys in order to get out of there for the evening. And um, so what happened was, I was at home and I got a call from a telemarketer and they were doing some kind of political survey. And I said the same thing as the guy says in my book, like, I don't, I don't do these. And she said, oh, please, I, I have to get home. I have my kids and blah, 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 and back to school night. And so I said, okay, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. And so we started doing the poll. And then a few minutes into the poll, we sort of got off topic. And she turned out to be really delightful and she was really funny. And we started talking about our husbands and about life and about kids not walking the dog and <laughs> just all sorts of different things. And she was really fun and I really liked her. And then right in the middle of this great conversation, it cut out, the phone went dead. And I, I went, my husband was in the living room and I, I walked in and I said, uh, I was just on the phone with a telemarketer and the call got dropped. And he looked up at me and he goes, that's a problem because. <laughs> well, no, she was really nice and we were having this great conversation and I didn't even get to say goodbye. And he just ignored me. And I went back into the kitchen and I thought, wow, well, that was sad. I didn't get to say goodbye to the nice woman. I thought, but can you imagine though, if that had been my soulmate and I just lost them just like that. And that's what gave me the idea. <coughs> and, uh, so that kind of got me going on that. And, um, you know, it was a good, a good way to start, a good jumping off point. Yeah, I know. And it's so annoying all through. They, they're so close all the time. And it's like, she's evil, that woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you a funny little story about how I came up with the name, The Fussy Virgin. So. I listened to this podcast called The Satellite Sisters, and I've been listening to them for about 10 years. They're five sisters who come from Connecticut, and they do a podcast once a week, um, just about life and family, and they're funny, and, and they're very apolitical. They don't get into anything controversial. It's just a happy place. And um, so one day I was out walking, and I was listening to the podcast on my, on my phone, and one of the sisters was talking about a TV series that she loved and it was noisy. There were gardeners with leaf blowers and I, I couldn't really hear very well. And it sounded like the series she was talking about was called The Fussy Virgin. And I thought, huh, that's a funny name for a series. 
So when I got home, I Googled it because I thought, well, I want to watch this show that she's raving about. I couldn't find it anywhere. I thought, huh, that's weird. So I went back into the podcast and I re-listened to the section that she was talking about the TV show. And it wasn't the, fuss, the Fussy Virgin. She was talking about a series called Fossey Verdon, which was about <laughs> Bob Fossey and Gwen Verdon, the dancers and their marriage. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, oh. So I thought that was really funny. So I went back to, they have a Facebook group for this podcast. So I went to the Facebook group. They've got about 7,000 members. And I said, funny thing happened today when I was listening to Liz talk about her favorite TV show. And I went through the whole thing. I explained what happened and everybody came on and said, that's really funny. That's really, they, the women who run the podcast came on and said, that's really funny. And then a bunch of them said, but boy, oh boy, I sure would read a book or watch a show called The Fussy Virgin. And, and, and somebody else said, me too, me too, me too, me too. So it was almost like I had free crowdsourcing on the name <laughs> and everybody thought it was a really funny, quirky name. And I was right in the middle of writing this rom-com about a, a writer who was writing a book about finding your soulmate. And I thought, the fussy virgin. And that's how I got it. So just this past week, I sent them I posted another note on their Facebook page and I said, hey, everybody, you may remember about two years ago, this happened. And, you know, I, I said, well, actually next week, my new book, The Fussy Virgin comes out from Bloodhound Books. And everybody came in, the hundreds of them, and they said, oh my God, I remember that. That's great. And they were like, we're buying it. And so then they, on this week's podcast, they said they did a whole little feature on it. So, yeah, so it's, I just thought it was like really, it, it was meant to be. So that was kind of a, an odd beginning for the book. Yeah, but what a cool story. <laughs> Not many authors will have that, I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> no, so it was, um, so hopefully it'll do well, the title, and all those, all those satellite sisters will, will really buy it and read it, <laughs> like they said they would. <laughs> yeah, I'll get my, um, my friends to read it as well, actually. Um, I mean, as you know, I said, I'm not really a, a rom-com. I don't read them generally, but I absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant. And I had to keep, yeah, I had to keep reading, so I had to know. I couldn't put it down until I knew. <laughs> <laughs> like and the I'm, last page. Yes, yes. And I'm thinking um, that I have a sequel idea. If the book does well, um, I'm thinking of doing the Fussy Virgin Wedding Planner. Awesome. And, um, you know, maybe to take it like as a, like the, the shopaholic, take it into a series of, because she's sort of an adorable, quirky character and um, with a lot of, you know, her own personal angst. And <laughs> so uh, I thought, yeah, well, why, why not? We could try that. So, um, yeah. So it's very exciting. And another thing that I liked when I messaged you was the reference to the Innocence Project. What made you decide to include that? That's a really good question. So, you know, when you're writing a book, you, your characters need to have an arc. I mean, from the beginning of the book to the end, they've got to change in some way. And in my case, because the premise of the book is that two soulmates won't come together until they have both gone on their journey, journeys, only then um, will are they ready to come together. So I had to really clearly delineate how they both had a journey. And so, he is someone who has just decided to give up his ideals and just lead the playboy life in New York. And his arc is that he goes back to really what he, he was raised to be, what his family had taught him. And he kind of got a little lost uh, on the way and got caught up in the New York lifestyle. And so I thought that the, Innoc the Innocence Project is really a, like one of the most noble endeavors and these people who work for the Innocence Project work on, for peanuts to add, but they free all these people who've been wrongly convicted. And I thought that was like the ultimate in, you know, a sacrifice kind of a job. So that's why I chose it. Yeah, I mean, it's not something we know much about over here, I don't think. I only know about it because I've done my degree and we touched on it in our psychology and I thought it was amazing what they do as well. So. Yeah, it was, it was perfect. 
Yeah, they freed, I mean, I did look it up when I was working on the book. I don't remember the number now, but they freed a lot of people, people who were, you know, so many people, I don't know about in the, U the UK, but here, a lot of times, especially if you're poor, you just don't have the proper legal representation. You know, they just, they throw you to the gutter and they put kids in jail, you know, for a bag of pot, you know, like, and they're in jail for 20 years for that. I mean, terrible. Yeah. Or they have more recent, as you know, DNA, more sophisticated DNA now that will exonerate people, but nobody's doing it. I mean, this is an outside agency. You would think that the police themselves would say, hey, let's rerun this DNA to make sure we got the right person in jail, but they don't. So. And there's no reason to, because the reason that DNA is being used more is because it's cheaper to do. They've found yeah. ways that are cheaper. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Madness. Exactly. So that was that was why I used that. I thought that was a good one. And um, also, you know, both of them had to come together. She also is kind of somebody who wants to save the whales and protect animals and like any any good cause. She's she's into it. And um, so I thought, OK, well, that would be a way that you could show that they were of like minds, really. And then, of course, there was the whole dog angle, you know, I. I <laughs> I mean, we, we know as authors, you never kill a dog. Just don't ever, ever kill a dog. Kill a dog, kill your buck. That's how it works. <laughs> that should be our mantra. They should teach that in like writing courses. That should be the day one. Kill a dog, kill your buck. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, not only will I not kill a dog here, I'm going to actually feature the dogs. They're going to be the friends. They're going to be involved in the story. So. Yeah, I think the political rally was one of the best with the dogs. That made me laugh quite a lot. I what made me laugh at it was I named the dog Bernice. <laughs> that just made it, I would I laughed every time I typed it because it's just such a preposterous name for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dog's called Nibble, so that's a pretty stupid name for a dog, really. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so we're, we'll see, you know, it was an experiment in rom-com. We'll see how it goes tomorrow. Hopefully it goes well. And if not, I'll go back to slashing and burning and cutting and <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, none of my books do that. But I will tell you about the one that's coming out in May um, that I'm working on. And I have to have my edits in next week. So um, it's called A Text Before Dying. And it, this also came from something that happened to me, which I don't think I told you about. I might have. So stop me if I did last time. I don't remember. So one day I was looking out my window of my apartment building and I live on the third floor and I got these new binoculars because so I, cause I live near the water so I can see the boats in the distance. And my husband bought these really good binoculars. And so I look out and I see what people are doing on their boats. And, you know, because it's COVID, so you're stuck inside all the time, right? So that's my activity. So I'm looking out at the boats. And one day I look down and there's a bench on the ground below me. And there are two of my, two of my neighbors are down there with their backs to me. And I'm up above. And they're both, it's a husband and wife. And they're both playing on their phones. So I start fooling around with the, with the focus controls and I'm zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. And the next thing you know, I realize I can read their phone screens. I can see what he's, he's playing Candy Crush and he's losing and she <laughs> is texting someone and I can read the texts. I mean, and I'm there squealing and my I say to my husband, come here, you got to see this. Oh, my God. And I said, I, and we're like, oh, wow, this is great. So <laughs> I'm, you know, they're not saying she's playing Candy Crush and she's, you know, saying like, uh, you want to meet for you know lunch tomorrow? It's like nothing interesting. But it got me thinking, what if some woman was looking out of her window with her binoculars and she looked down and somebody was planning a murder on their text? So that is how that started. And so that is the story. It takes place in New York City and the woman lives on Central Park and she looks down and she sees a woman across the street in Central Park on a bench with a man and she reads her text and that's what she reads. But the problem is it happens 
in 2020. And so when she goes to the police, she's unable to describe what the woman looks like because she had on a mask. <laughs> so that's the, the plot. Now in this particular book, uh, A Text Before Dying, she is a conspiracy theorist. And so she's, you know, her, her pastime is to go out and follow up on crimes around New York City. And she's always phoning things into the police and she's phoning things into the United Nations. And she's kind of known around New York, like, oh yeah, her. And so like a boy who cried wolf, when she actually really sees a crime, um, nobody's that interested. So, and so there's, and she does it with her friend who's a hypochondriac. And so between the two of them, <laughs> there is a lot of humor in it. Um, and um, there's a lot of FaceTiming back and forth because of COVID, they're on the phone quite a bit. So that's what I'm working on now. Wow, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, what made you choose to include COVID? Did it help your story? I suppose it kind of... That's a great question <laughs> too. Um, you know, about a year ago or maybe eight, nine months ago, that was a big question going around in author circles. Like, do we, do we use COVID? Do we not use COVID? And I think at the time in the beginning, um, most of us didn't know how long this was gonna go on. And so I remember a lot of authors saying, well, you know, uh, I'm just gonna ignore this spring, summer, you know, we'll just put that to the side. And then spring, summer went into winter and now coming into the new spring. And so, I think it's kind of hard to, I mean, we don't know how long really we're going to be stuck in. It looks like it's going to be longer than we thought. And, you know, these are years that are going by. And I kind of thought, well, you can't completely ignore it, right? I mean, it's, I didn't get into any of the death and dying thing or the sickness. That's, that's, it's really about the mask wearing. It's really about you can't tell who anyone is. Um, but I kind of think, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I think it's an important thing to chronicle um, in a book. And I know another, another of the Bloodhound authors is also a friend of mine. She's also writing one. Uh, I think she finished it, actually, that's coming out in July, um, Diana Wilkinson has one coming out in July. Um, and she did the same. It's also about a murder during COVID and the, and the things that have happened in COVID that make it different than when it wasn't COVID. So it, it's actually, I think, kind of an interesting, it's, it's writing stories that otherwise would never have been able to be written without, without COVID. Yeah, it's a it's a unique situation, isn't it? So it it should bring up some interesting sort of angles for stories, I would think. Well, what she did, she does is she goes to the cops, and the cop says uh, he sort of is skeptical about her because he thinks she's a little off. But he says, well, you know, what does she look like? This woman, this masked woman, and and so the girl says, well. Um, well, I don't know exactly. I mean, she had on a hat and sunglasses and a mask and, you know, uh, she had a long brown ponytail. She, she, she was, well, she could be white or she could be black and she could be Asian, she could be Indian. Um, and so the, the cop's like, well, you know, that's a little rough. You know, is she old, young? And she's like, well, I don't know. Uh, you know, so, and I, and I did um, confer with a bunch of New York City police officers. So I come from a big family of cops and my grandfather was a cop. My husband's father was a cop. Half my cousins are cops. Um, cousins, I have cousins in the FBI. So I have a lot of people to tap into. And so um, one of my relatives is a female New York City police officer. And um, I talked to her a lot about what it's like to be a police officer in Manhattan and in the city during this COVID, how things have changed, the, the struggles, the challenges. And one of the challenges for sure was, uh, how do you identify people? <laughs> like, how do you do a lineup? I mean, it's pretty hard. And so it's really changed the way they do things. Yeah, that's really interesting because I suppose you'd have to look for different clues in people to identify them instead of their face. Yes. You have to go and make judgments, I suppose. Yes, exactly. And she was also telling me, you know, they don't bring them into the station. So normally, if you had a crime you wanted to report, especially a murder, 
you'd go in, they would, they would, you know, take your name at the front desk, and then they would hook you up with a detective to report if it's a murder. And then you'd go into a conference room and you would give your report to the detective. Well, not anymore. So now you sit out in the, you sit out in the main lot, like where you walk in the hallway and they will interview you there with other people all around. I mean, distanced, but there's no privacy. There's no, everything is done in that front room. Wow. Or outside even because of COVID. So little, I was trying to make it authentic to find out those kinds of things. Yeah, I wonder what we, I don't even know. I think we wear masks, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> I don't suppose I need to know, but yeah, that's interesting. What a difference. Yeah, a total difference. I, I mean, I would imagine they, they do lineups with, maybe it's more, they listen to voices, they hear people speak, maybe that's what they do. But it would really be like, as I was writing this book, it, it really, would be impossible to identify someone who has a face mask on, big aviator sunglasses, a baseball hat. Impossible, other than height. Yeah. And weight, height and weight, maybe. But that's it. I mean, really, even a, a race is hard to identify because, I mean, people, skin color could be, you could be a light skinned black person or a dark skinned white person or or tan, <laughs> you could have gone to the beach, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was, that's fun. And then, um, but right now I'm so focused on the fussy virgin and what she's going to do, you know, that's, that's the, and, and I do, I, I secretly hope it does well, because I really would like to write a bunch more. Did you put any uh, secret jokes or messages in that one? In the, in the COVID one? Or the, the fussy virgin. Oh, the fussy virgin. Yes. Yeah, so I, well, a few, um, a few. I, I think I told you one of them was that um, uh, somebody had posted a review on one of my earlier books and called it a grubby little novel, and um, I thought that was just so poetic, and so I posted that in in my book. There is a writer who talks about getting reviews and one of them he reads it to his friends and he says it's a grubby little novel so that made me laugh and then of course um orion marketing is uh my first name spelled backwards moira and um i like that too i <laughs> those are the only two see little secrets that i threw in there but i think a lot of authors do that yeah um not many actually i quite like to ask that question and some are straight away like, yes, I do. And most of the time people are like, do I? Ah. And then generally they're like, no, not really. I do use my friends' names a lot for, um, I, I use them for character names or even just like little bits and pieces. And, and I, I say, I always tell them all, well, you, you may be in my book and if you if you have to read it, if you want to know if you're in it. But, um, and this one, oh, you know what? This one was really fun. So in this book, um, I have a, a friend who ha has a charity in New York City called Circle of Generosity, and they raise money to do random acts of kindness for people, um, you know, family members sick and they, they take care of something. And he's been running this charity for about 10 years and it does really good work. And so I got to talking with him and it was the timing was just right. And I said, well, what if I was able to do a book naming in the book for someone they could buy a character? And so I checked in with Bloodhound and the timing was right. And so the head of Bloodhound said, sure, okay, go for it. So the Fussy Virgin was up in December for this charity, an online auction, and somebody bid on it. We raised several hundreds of dollars um, for the, the charity. And so there, there's a character in the book who was named after this woman's daughter. Well. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that was really, it was nice to be able to do it. It just worked out the timing of the edits and everything just, it was meant to be. So, and as it turns out, a few people who have looked at the manuscript said that the, the name of the person who I used in the book was better than the one that I'd come up with. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, okay, well, like, all right. That, then it worked out for me too. <laughs> <laughs> and do your friends prefer your um, rom-com to your thrillers or are they just big fans of both? 
You know, I think it's like you, it depends on the genre you like. So uh, most of my friends seem to like psychological suspense more, but a few of them, the, oh, well, this I'll tell you is that the young people, wait, Donna, I have to tell in case anyone's listening to this, can we tell them I have a bite plate in my mouth? Because I feel like I keep, <laughs> anyone who's I've listening. Been nice. I've been nice to do. <laughs> I, I, I broke my tooth in the front, not the front, one, right here. And so I have a fake thing in my mouth and, and it, sl it slips out <laughs> periodically, which is why I'm <laughs> tripping over words. So there you are. Um, I I'm getting an implant soon, so, but it's not, not for a few more weeks. Um, so anyway, when I was reading the book, you may have noticed at the end in the acknowledgements, I, if, you, if you read, do you read acknowledgements at the end of books? I started getting included in some, so yeah, I do now. <laughs> oh, now I may be. Okay, Donna, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you in mind for the next one. Um, so anyway, in this one, I mean, I had a lot of people help me with this because what happened was I was writing about a 29-year-old woman, and I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not 29. And uh, so, but I was really concerned that I wouldn't sound authentic. I mean, even though I think I'm hip and cool, just by the fact that I use the word hip, it says I'm not. <laughs> <Anyway>. um, <laughs> um, you know, I was afraid I wouldn't sound like a 29 year old and I wouldn't be addressing the things that 29 year olds want to talk, that they talk about and how they talk to each other. And so I, I got a group of five women who were in their 20s and asked them if they would just go through this thing and just rip it apart. Like what sounded real, what didn't sound real, what would they never talk about, what would they talk more about? And they did, they were great. And, and then I had all these words that I looked, I went Googling, like all these like urban slang, you know, and I, I was throwing them into the book and they were like, no. <laughs> Don't do it. No. Don't say that. No, no, no. They were like, no, no, no. So they they kept me honest. And um, but what was great about it, it at the end is they all said the same thing to me privately. How did you know what we talk about? And I said, I didn't. I was going into my own database of what I talked about when I was 29 with my girlfriends. And if you're telling me that's what you're talking about, that means nothing has changed. It's the same old, same old, maybe a little different technology. We didn't have Instagram and that kind of stuff, but it's the same old thing where you know, I would sit around with my girlfriends and go like, does he like me? Why didn't he call? If he liked me, he would have called. I would, you know, <laughs> and, and the, the girl said, yeah, we still do that. We still, yeah, it's a little different. He didn't text, you know, and <laughs> it's a little different technology thing. So um, that was really fun to work with them um, to really make sure I stayed on, on target with them. And I'm, and also what was interesting is as you know, in, in the book, there are sections that are her writing the Fussy Virgin book, which I tried to, I thought they were funny. The younger ones loved it the most. Uh, the older people liked it, but it was the younger ones who said, oh, that, that was really good. That was funny there. That was, so it's, it's interesting because different age groups will respond to this differently. Um, and I had people read it from the youngest person was 24 and the oldest was 92. My mother-in-law, don't tell anyone I said her age. She's now 93. Um, but the younger ones really were so helpful. I, I can't tell you. I think, I don't think it would have felt as good without them. Yeah, I remember reading that actually in the acknowledgements and it made me laugh at the time. <laughs> you had help from the age group yeah it was funny yeah. well I mean I was using words like um I, I really literally work like I, I googled like words millennials use I mean this is so pathetic and like I was saying things like in the dialogue he's really snacky and my <laughs> the 20-somethings were like no oh no oh no get that out of there we don't say he's snacky. I was like well it's that on the on the on this website you did we don't <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. So, uh, you know, we don't say woke. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. 
<laughs> so. really good. This is news to me as well. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was that was a fun thing, and I so it, it just speaks to like I think when you're writing, whether you're conferring with somebody in the FBI or a police officer, or when I wrote without her consent, I talked to a, an obstetrical nurse to make sure that you know you got it because you know what they're gonna if it does if you don't get it right it, it's not gonna ring true I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, because people notice, don't they? <laughs> I think they do, or it just doesn't feel right. And and then, of course, you have people who, who read it who are cops. You know, I, my cousins all read it. Oh, my God, do my cousins read my stuff. And they grade me. <laughs> they got, uh, you, got, you got this wrong. Uh, you got that right. Um, did I, I, don't, I don't know if I told you this the last time, but in my first book, uh, I Never Left, there was a scene where uh, the there's a dead body and the room is smelling terrible. And somebody I know who was a writer said, oh, well, all the cops put Vicks Vapo Rub under their nose so they don't have to smell the smell. And I said, they do? And she goes, oh yeah. And she was very, very sure of this. I mean, she, it was like, don't you know that? And I'm like, no, I didn't know that, okay. So I included it, stupid me, I included it in my book. So book goes, comes out, and a couple of my cop cousins call me up and they say, well, you know, you actually got all, most of the cop stuff felt real, felt good, felt, except, except that uh, Vicks Vapo Rub. I was like, no? And they're like, only if you want to get left out of the police force by your peers. <laughs> uh, like that would be, you know what I mean? Like that would be considered like weak. Um, only a loser would do that, you know, like just wouldn't do that. <laughs> Would be, you know, so little things like that. Uh, you you want to get the nuances. It sounds like, well, sure, yeah, I can see why they would put fixed vapor rub under their nose. I would if it were me, but but a cop, a macho cop, no, they don't do mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I'm sure my forensics lecturer said that she put vapor rub when if she ever had to go to smelly scenes. So <laughs> is, she, is she a cop or a? You, she was a forensic scientist. Uh, she was blood specialist. She's obsessed with blood. Even now, she gets excited about it. It's quite worrying. <laughs> but well, she's awesome, so. But see, I think that she's different because the, the reason the cops don't do it is because they're cops, right? So, but she's a scientist. So yeah, she would do it. I would do it too. Um, but a cop, no. It's just not. I did it when I uh, dissected a rat. Well, I had um, something else, some disinfectant, but it helped. But now I can't smell that disinfectant without remembering dust in a rat. So, but you know, whatever. <laughs> I think I think in high school they I was in biology and they we had to dissect frogs one day. So I, I think that was one of the days I went out to smoke cigarettes in the parking lot because I yeah didn't want to do that. Just for the record, I haven't smoked since high school, in case anyone's listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your most embarrassing story? Oh, Donna, there's too, way too many to even. Uh, <laughs> there always is. <laughs> uh, OK, well, I, one that just happened very recently. So our over here um, is different from the UK about who can and cannot get um, vaccines. There's different criteria. I know over there it's just by age or something, right? But here there's also, <laughs> like, you know, you can, if you have a comorbid condition, if you have diabetes, if you have, if you're a teacher, like my son has gotten the vaccine. He's, he works in a school, he's 24. His mother, no, she's still here, like <laughs> going to possibly get infected, but he's, he's, he's vaccinated. Um, so there's all different criteria. So um, my husband was eligible to get a vaccine. So it was on our wedding anniversary two weeks ago. So we go to this big, I said to my husband, listen, listen, uh, I heard that they uh, have, if they have extra vaccines at the end of the day, they, they don't wanna throw them out because they're not refrigerated anymore. I heard that if you're there, they'll give them to you. And if you're just there, and so he's like, okay. I said, so I'm gonna come with you. And I think it's a sign because it's our wedding anniversary. I'm pretty sure it's a sign. I, I'm gonna get the vaccine. I'm, I, I feel it, I feel it. And so he's like, okay. So I was like, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. 
we're going to pull up. So I'm thinking it's going to be a drive up, which it wasn't. And, and when they come over with the, with the hypodermic needle, they're, they're going to say, hello. And, and you say, well, this is a very good day for me getting my shot. And you know what else it is? It's if I next one, at the end of the day, maybe she could get one. So we get there and it's not a drive up. You have to get out of your car. So we go up this huge civic center, which is a sea of wheelchairs and walkers. I mean, a sea. And now I'm feeling a little bit like, you know, I go bopping up in my, with my phone, I got my sunglasses on. <laughs> <laughs> Do I really want to try to like get my shot? Like with all these people in wheelchairs, like this doesn't feel right to me, but I thought, but still, you know, if they're going to throw it away, you know, okay. So we go up and my husband, uh, they said, do you have an appointment? He says, yes. And they go, well, go right in. So there I am. And they look at me and they, and it's very chaotic. And they're like, yes, what, 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 what do you, what's your problem? What do you need? I said, oh, well, um, I don't actually have an appointment, but I was with my husband and I thought, and they go, wait on the helpline. So I thought, ah, okay, great. There's a little crack in the window. Maybe, maybe there's some room here for me. So I sit down next to one lady in a wheelchair and another lady in a wheelchair. <laughs> and then I sit there on the line with, mainly people who are in their 90s and I'm listening to their conversations and they're like half of them are loopy and they're all over the map and so finally a man a big burly guy comes out in his 50s wearing a mask you know everybody's in masks and he, he, he's going down the help line and he's asking everybody what their problem is and he goes to the first woman down the row from me and she, and he, he says, well, what, what, why, what's the problem? Why are you on the helpline? And as all good 97 year olds do, they, they tell you about their daughter told them, you know, that she goes, well, my daughter told me that if I can't, you know, and she's on and on the guy's like, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> and then he gets to the next one. And again, she's like, well, my friend Marcia said, <laughs> <It's going on. laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, look at all these old people get to the point, get to the point. So then he gets to me and he goes, okay, why are you on the helpline? I said, well, it's my anniversary. <laughs> my husband <laughs> and I see his eyes glaze over. And I realized, Donna, I crossed over into old person land. I <laughs> <laughs> so he, I go through this whole long thing about how <laughs> it's been wonderful being married to my husband <laughs> and all this stuff and how, you know, we're, we're going to celebrate our anniversary. And we th I thought it was a sign. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Finally, I finished this whole long winded thing. And he just says, are you over 65? I said, no. He goes, you can't get a vaccine. Go. And I was like, okay. <laughs> that was, it, was, it, was, it was embarrassing. Yes, it was embarrassing. <laughs> I wonder if you'll be the one that he goes home and tells his family about this woman today. <laughs> Yeah, she, she looked like she was going to be normal when I approached her. And then she started going on about her anniversary. We have like, there's patients all over the place in wheelchairs. They have them on stretchers. And I'm, and I'm blabbing on. And I'm... <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Um, if you were going to be stranded on a desert island, what three things would you want with you? Oh, well, would I, does, does Wi-Fi go? Do you get Wi-Fi? Oh, we could try. Okay. Well, we'll assume we have Wi-Fi. <laughs> that there's a, you know, the satellites do fly around the world. So, yeah. right? Right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Well, then I would take my computer and my phone and a jar of peanut butter. You need, I mean, it's very healthy, real. I mean, it's like you could you could live on peanut butter. Yeah, like, yeah. Couldn't think of anything more disgusting. You don't like it? I don't like peanuts. I don't like the smell of them. Just oh. I suppose you like Marmite. Nope. Oh no. Oh, okay. All right. Because I think that's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, just what were they thinking? Seriously, just weird. I don't know. Do people still eat Marmite? Is that a thing still? Yeah, someone posted about Marmite hummus the other day. Oh. Yeah, apparently it was nice, but 
<laughs> well, I should, you know, I, I might take that back because as you know, in the Fussy Virgin, there is a flaming Hot Cheeto theme. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that, but yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, I might I might go with the flaming hot Cheetos. Um, those are pretty darn good. Um, and only I don't, you know, I was trying to talk to the people in, in my advanced reader group about it. If I didn't know if you guys had it over in the UK, because the ones that we have here, the thing about them is is that you can always tell if someone's been eating them because their fingers are red. So it, it's just almost unless you use like a a tweezer to, make, to pick up your Cheetos. It's like no way, it just gets into your cuticles when you <laughs> stick your hand in the bowl or the bag. And um, so, uh, you know, I they, I was thinking of writing to Frito-Lay and telling them, hey, you know. <laughs> Get a lifetime supply. <laughs> like a little, yeah, right. Oh, Donna, you know, I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, so I've actually advertised you all through the book all the time it's just about them except though i was i did think of it and because my husband said you should call frito lay or send an email or post something because a couple of times they kind of knock the, the cheetos like the ones who don't like it they talk about your fingers are always red it's full of chemicals and i thought mm, they might not enjoy mm. that part <laughs> yeah that's a good point just just skip away for that or just edit that a little bit yeah <laughs> under the radar yeah absolutely um, what superpower superpower would you choose if you were going to have a superpower? I don't remember if you asked me this last time, but yeah, I can't remember. But I'm asking you again. So. Well, hopefully, if anyone ever compared, I'd say the same thing. But I think the thing that pops is time travel. I would like to time travel. I think that would be cool. But I would want it. I would want to be able to have like a shield around me so that I couldn't be, you know, killed or something. You know, I'd like some kind of protection but wouldn't it be cool to time travel yeah yeah as long as you weren't at risk of whatever was happening at the time then yeah absolutely right, right like an outlander she ends up in the middle of like a scottish battlefield you know like that did you see outlander i've heard of it but i haven't seen it well the one thing that bugs me about that series i didn't read the book i saw the show is that she goes back in time and never once does this man, this Jamie Frazier, who's quite delicious to look at, but never once does Jamie Frazier say to his, his, his wife, his new wife, so what's it like in the future? I mean, I'm talking five, ser five seasons and not once does Jamie Frazier ever <laughs> say, so dear, what's it like in the future? What do you have, how do you, what's different? Never had that conversation. I mean, I just, that, that always bugged me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, I'd want to know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what time would you choose to go back to? <laughs> well, I have this little fantasy that I would go back to like the beginning of the 20th century. And when my grandparents were young, teenagers, and I would love to meet them. I yeah, think that would be cool. <laughs> And all the clothes and stuff were cool then as well. And it was just different, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I agree. It was. It was a, you know, when I think about my, my father was the youngest of three children by a lot. Like his older sister was like 15 years older. And my grandfather was an older father. Like he got married later in life. So my grandfather was born in 1880s. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So when I think about what my grandfather experienced, like he fought in World War I, uh, he, he rode horseback hunting for Pancho Villa in, in Mexico, Texas, um, that kind of thing, before there were cars, really. So it would be, I think there's been so many changes, the 20th century going from no cars to the internet to people walking on the moon to, I mean, the, the changes, are, I, I think they have to be the most extreme. And flying as well, you know, flying. from having no cars to being able to not only drive, but fly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and medicine, what happened in medicine, I mean, what they are able to do in the 20th century that they couldn't do before, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. So that would be really cool to go back and at the beginning of the 20th century and just see what it was like. I had a, I had a neighbor who years ago, when I first got married, 
who was in the Harvard class of 1924. And I was young when I knew him and he lived right across the street from me and he worked in New York City. He still went to work every day. I lived in the suburb of New York and I used to ride the train in with him. And on holidays, special occasions, he'd wear his Harvard tie to work. And I used to just pick his brain on that train the entire way in every morning and ask him about life. What was life like? Um, at the, at the time. And he remembers World War I. He remembered it. And he remembered what the streets were like and what it was like when they declared war. And, you know, it was, it, it's fascinating. So that kind of stuff I love. Yeah, my, um, my granddad's, he's 93 and he remembers the Second World War. Um, he was born in 1927, so he was old enough to remember and yeah it's absolutely fascinating I love it when he tells me about you know what they had to do and stuff but they talk about it with fondness always you know he said it was tough he said but it was easier well I think everybody pitched in so much um my aunt my father's older sister she was in the um well women volunteered they they became they worked in the armies I guess I'm sure it was the same in the UK but I think that, you know, unlike what we've seen with this virus, um, it seems like people were pulling together more then. Um, and not, not as much here, there's still so much divisiveness. And um, it's, it's a shame really, that because it's, it's a common enemy for all of us, the virus. Yeah. And so why there's divisiveness, I don't know, but. No, it's frustrating because we, in this country, we pulled together at first. When it first happened, we were great. It was great. Everyone, you know, really stuck together. And then it sort of went away for the summer. And then when it came back, everyone's just back to being assholes again. <laughs> and it's a shame. It really is a shame. I know. I know. Well, hopefully it'll soon be behind us and um, we can move on and I can start writing. It does make rom-coms a little tricky to write if, if they're in masks. So I think, I think most authors are hoping this goes away because it, it does, it does make challenges. It would get pretty boring if everyone is wearing masks in every book, wouldn't it? I don't know how they're going to do TV shows. I mean, how are you going to do a current series? I mean, you'd have to be, I've seen masks on some shows, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Or they're like miles apart. Yeah. <laughs> but then do you find now when you're watching something and they're all close together, you're like, oh no, there shouldn't be. Oh. It's yeah. just, oh, how easily our minds change. It's just like, oh no, you shouldn't be sitting so close. I know. Like the idea of shaking someone's hand, like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> Think about what I used to, I was just saying this to my husband the other day. When I was living in Manhattan, I used to take a subway to work and I used to go onto the subway I was squeezed, they were squeezed in at rush hour. I mean, literally bodies up against bodies and you were just like this. And then you had your hand on a on a strap hanger, you know, they, the, the thing where you're holding onto a pole, a dirty, grimy, germy, viral pole. And, and then I get to work and I didn't wash my hands. Like, what? Like, like, ew, how did I do that and not die all those years? I don't even know. I know, yeah, same, like our London Underground sounds similar, pretty gross. Yeah, yeah, it's fine, we'll just get off and carry on our day, not even think about it. <laughs> you know, open a bagel, like, ah, after you touch the pole and put it in your mouth and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back in the day, back in like the 50s and the 40s, women used to wear white gloves. And, and so when they would commute, you know, it was on the glove and then they would take the gloves off when they'd get to work. And, you know, my mother said she had two pair. She had one to go into work and one to go out of work. And so she put them in a little bag and then they washed them. I don't know, but everybody did that. That was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a great idea to me. I know. Now it sounds like a fabulous idea. <laughs> Um, well, I don't think I have any more questions for you, unless there's anything else that you haven't told us that you want to tell us. No, I've been blabbing for a long time. So um, I hope that we don't, if whoever listens to, I'll probably shut me off in the middle, but um, <laughs> like, oh, uh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's always fun to talk to you, Jana. Always. And you, always. I was looking forward to talking to you again. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> 
All right. Well, listen, we'll, we'll keep in touch as we always do. And uh, thank you very much. And thanks for squeezing me in right before the launch of Fussy Virgin tomorrow. And of um, course. I, hope, I hope people read it and like it. All I can say is, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun, happy place to read right now. I'll be sharing it everywhere for you tomorrow as well, making uh -huh. sure. Yeah, thank you. All over. <laughs> All right, my dear, you have a great rest of your day and um, we'll, we'll chit chat online this week. Yes, definitely. I, I want to know how it's doing tomorrow. So I'll be messaging you. <laughs> okay, great. Bye, Donna.